Please join me in welcoming Beatrice and Tetwa to our stage. And I turn the program over now to Charlene Hunter Galt. Thank you, Dean Royster. And uh, you've heard from everybody now except uh, Beatrice. So I'd, I'd actually like to start with her because one of the things that I have found in my trips uh, when I was still based in South Africa, I would come back to the United States and decry what was going on in Zimbabwe, and people would look at me like I had lost my mind because they still had the image of the uh, uh, transition from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe and the role that Robert Mugabe played in their minds. And thank, no thanks to our US media, uh, there had not been a lot of attention paid to Zimbabwe since it became a democratic state country. And so I've had the, over the years to try and help people understand that the Zimbabwe in their mind is not the Zimbabwe that exists today. And that is one of the reasons I am so thrilled that Beatrice Mtetwa is here. And I heard her talk herself yesterday about those early days of uh, freedom and democracy in uh, Zimbabwe, and I would like her just briefly to recount her own role in welcoming the Zimbabwean democracy, and then maybe just ease into what it's like today so that we can engage the rest of the panel. But you were among those who had a welcoming for democracy, welcoming to democracy, right? Yes, I mean, virtually everybody at that time was uh, uh, on a high because uh, the majority of us were happy that uh, President Mugabe had, uh, his party had won the, the elections. I was a student at the time in Edinburgh and we organized probably the biggest and longest celebration party uh, we got all the students from Glasgow, from Aberdeen, and uh, we were that happy about uh, uh, his ruling party winning. And we had reason to be, because he, he is an articulate man. He is a very bright man. Uh, and uh, in his independent speech, he said all the right things. He spoke of reconciliation long before it became a buzzword in South Africa. He made it very clear that there was not going to be any retribution and that everybody in Zimbabwe should work for the common good of Zimbabweans going forward and that we should all work together. And in fact, in his first cabinet, we had a, a, a range of people in the cabinet. We had a, his former foes in the cabinet. So. I mean, we all believed that it would uh, really get better. And uh, so when I graduated uh, and I started working in Zimbabwe, I worked as a prosecutor for the government. And, uh, you know, we went through the motions. Things would uh, 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 work as we thought they should. But uh, there were the problems in the southern part of the country which uh, we largely unacknowledged at the time. Uh, in fact, there was a pretense that everything was going on okay. So only those of us who had friends who came from that particular region were aware of what was going on. And that something was going on also became clear because suddenly there were detentions without trial. Uh, and uh, even if you got uh, arrested, there was a law passed which uh, uh, gave the minister the power to really admit you to bail. If there was a ministerial certificate against bail, 
the courts couldn't give you bail. And it became quite clear that, you know, there wasn't a subversion of, of what the Constitution says. And about what time and was that? That this was into from the, around, into the... around 1983, 84, 85. But for me, what became stuck and personal was a case that I dealt with in 1985 as a prosecutor. I prosecuted four members of the ruling party who had uh, been charged with political violence against a member of Bishop Muzorewa's party. And uh, uh, what they had done to this woman and her kids for me really was so despicable that they ought to, go, to have gone to jail. What did they do? And they had made this woman, after beating her up, take off her clothes in a township called Mavuku. They made her roll her clothes up and carry them on her head and then walk in the townships Naked. Naked, with her two teenage sons behind her. And I mean, under African culture, that's absolute taboo to see your mother naked, even in the house. I think that would but be true in this culture as well. <laughs> naked, walking the streets of a township with a crowd looking, I thought that was so despicable that it ought to really be, 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 be dealt with severely. And they did get sentences of between eight months and 24 months. But they were pardoned after spending only one night in jail. And I never would have discovered this if fate had not uh, you know, uh, made one of the accused persons a complainant in a case that, was, that I was to deal with the following week, where this man had been fired unlawfully uh, from his work. And at the time, it was a criminal offense to, fall, to just fire someone from work without due process. So, we were going to prosecute the employer the following week, and then I completed my forms for this man to be brought from jail to be a witness. And the prison officers came back and said, oh, sorry, those guys only spent one night, and I thought it was a mistake. Now, you were working for the government I was at that working time. for the government. And on the day of the trial, the guy came, and when I said, why are you not in jail? And he actually laughed at me with a smack on his face, and I was like, this is not good. And uh, that's when I said, you know, I, I don't think I can continue to be part of this because this is not just. And, and the magistrate I appeared before, who is the one who had dealt with the case previously, just there, uh, you know, said, oh, don't worry. And he, this employer pleaded guilty. He was supposed to, to, to be ordered to reinstate this person to pay him uh, 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 his salary for the period of unlawful, uh, 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 you know, dismissal, and um, also to pay a fine. The magistrate just said, "Okay, you've pleaded guilty, Mr. Sorenso. You're a bad man. We don't do that in Zimbabwe anymore. Uh, uh, but you're cautioned and discharged." Which to me was like, "Huh? Eh? What's going on here?" And when I asked him, he said, "Well, I mean, he's not going to get justice in my court." because if he believed in our type of justice, he would be in jail. I said to him, but two wrongs can't possibly make a right, you know, I mean. You know, he's entitled to see how this system should work. He said, well, he should go to the same people who released him for his type of justice. And this magistrate was an ex-combatant. He had fought in the war of liberation. I mean, for me, that was when I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be part of this because it's like I'm really aiding and abetting a system that's breaking down. And how many years into the democracy was this? This was 85, 86. Four, four or five years? Five years. Five yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then you became, uh, Then you I, left. I then left government and went into private practice. And then from around 1990, that's when <coughs> I concentrated uh, on, on human rights work. I want to get some more details from you in a moment, but let me just quickly ask John. Uh, when I interviewed F.W. de Klerk, yes. uh, just prior to the um, multiracial democracy coming uh, to power, I said, how is it going to feel uh, after all these years in power to be out of power? And you know what his response was? He said, well, uh, we're not going to be out of power long because 
a liberation movement has never succeeded as a government. Now, what Beatrice is telling me about this ex-combatant who is now, you know, uh, uh, ab going against the law, is this typical? I mean, was F.W. de Klerk right about these liberation movements? And, and speaks particularly of Zimbabwe and then maybe broaden it out. Beatrice Mtetwa is a Democrat, but she's a Democrat of a particular stripe. She's a Nelson Mandela Democrat. Nelson Mandela was willing to come out of jail after 27 years and honor the rule of law above anything else. That gave him the foundation, it seemed to me, to manage the transition in a way that was acceptable to all stakeholders in, in the case of South Africa. It was a very different psychology than has prevailed, and that's the great tragedy of Zimbabwe. Well, Jeff, what do you think about that? I mean, you, you've observed Zimbabwe for how long now? About, yeah, almost a decade. Mm -hmm. I'm really dating myself now, but yeah, about that long. But it's interesting because when you're talking about liberation parties and the issue of power in, in just Southern Africa, a liberation party has never lost an election ever in, in the region. If you look at Mozambique, you look at Angola, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, they've never lost. And within the region, you've only had, out of the 15 countries in the Southern African Development Community, only three countries have had actually a political turnover in the executive, Lesotho, Mauritius, um, and, and Zambia. The others, it's either the same person in Mugabe's case or Des Dos Santos' case in Angola or the same political party. So it's, it's important to remember that Zimbabwe, it's a horrible situation, it's horribly repressive, um, but it's also not an anomaly in the region. Um, you know, you, you, have this, you have this larger narrative of political elites hanging on to power at any cost. And going back to what Beatrice was saying about you know, the early days of Zimbabwe and democracy, there was a lot of hope. You know, Mugabe was championed internationally. He came to D.C., gave a round of talks at Howard University, at, at other colleges. He was a guest of Jimmy Carter, uh, President Jimmy Carter at the White House. You know, there was international fanfare surrounding surrounding this man, but at the same time he was giving this great, this great uh, Independence Day speech. He was already working with the North Koreans on what ultimately ended up being what some called the genocide in the, in the Matubili land area of Zimbabwe where upwards of 20,000 people were killed. Um, I think Samantha Power covers it in her book, A Problem from Hell, about the U.S. response or lack thereof to genocide. Um, so from very early on, you, you started seeing the, the warning signs um, with Mugabe and in, in Zimbabwe. Sarah, you, how long have you been observing Zimbabwe in particular, and do you have any sense of, of what made that change? Was it always there, or you know, going back to liberation movements not being able to successfully function as a democratic, in a democratic space? What do you think about that? Uh, well, in 2005, I was actually living in South Africa, and Operation Murambatsvina was occurring where 700,000 people were displaced internally in Zimbabwe um, in an effort to disperse an opposition party's political base back out into the rural areas where it would be harder for them to mobilize and, uh, and vote. And I came back to the U.S., um, much like your experience, and I was raging and railing about this terrible human rights crisis that occurred and uh, no one knew what I was talking about, let alone where Zimbabwe was on a map. Um, so I've been involved uh, for close to 15, uh, 10 years now as well. And um, so you know, in regards to it, a lot of it is just it's, in, when you first came out as a liberation hero and you, um, you, you gained this freedom for your country, it gave you a lot of uh, autonomy and authority uh, to sort of do what you want, and you had earned your stripes. Um, you had fought the fight, you had fought the battle, um, you had stood up to the colonial authorities, and that gave you a lot of legitimacy as a ruler. Um, and that is still what is played today uh, in regards to if you're not a war veteran in Zimbabwe, if you have not had that uh, legitimacy to your political history is very challenging for you to move forward and to, uh, to challenge the ruling party in any way. Um, but governments have also had to shift away from that and become creative. And so you'll see them also finding ways to repress, repress other groups um, in a way that is not dissimilar to what happened here. Um, but uh, LGBT groups and um, sexual identity individuals are often targeted 
as a way to sort of say, like, this is Western culture, this is not human rights, this is an abomin abomination, this is, uh, you know, against the rule of nature, and are used to whip people up into a frenzy. Um, and, you know, we actually had seen this here in the U.S. in the 2000s and um, the George Bush campaigns, and this is something that is often used quite a bit on the continent as a way to uh, distance people and to retain power and to show that there's a differentiation between us and them, between the West and between African rulers. So there's, you know, the legitimacy of having been a liberation hero still has some play. It's just lessening, particularly among youth, which is the biggest uh, demographic population bubble on the continent. And so there is, you know, some of a shift into how also to maintain that political power. Remind, I'm coming to you now, Deborah, but um, John will probably shoot me if I say this, but because uh, I know he, well, John maintains the most optimistic view of South Africa, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But the pre current president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, uh, who heads the ruling party, has said that the African National Congress, which is the ruling party, will rule till Jesus comes. And that goes back to what you were just saying, that these liberation movements tend to think they have uh, authority in, a, in, uh, in, in uh, perpetuity. Uh, but Deborah, I was going to ask you in particular, um, uh, Jeff mentioned Woza. Uh, the women of, Zim, uh, women of Zimbabwe arise. Uh, what role have the, has the women, have the women played in, uh, in Zimbabwe, and are they treated any differently, you think, than others? Because there were women in the movement, in the, in the, in the, in the liberation struggle. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think what we're seeing here is just a study of power that continue, the characteristics of power always um, are the same regardless of the social or political context. So you have uh, disenfranchised groups come into power and then unfortunately create a, an elite um, that, can, that then reinforces making an other like you were talking about, someone else becomes the other or the oppressed group. So in the case of women, um, certainly in Zimbabwe but in other parts who were like hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder, then once the power came, it was difficult for it to be shared. And so therefore, a lot of times, even though in many countries in Africa, the Constitution is a lot more liberal than, say, in the United States, as it relates to carving out roles for women, making sure it's part of the Constitution. I think in the United States, you have the fewer, fewest women in, 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 in power than in any, many of the African countries, exactly. in particular Rwanda, exactly. uh, South Africa, and exactly. others. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I believe that, it's, that women uh, continue to hold the tension uh, in any country in terms of between the power and the elite and the human rights work that still needs to be done through their organizing efforts, through the civil disobedience, through lifting up and supporting leaders like um, you, Beatrice, I think without strong women who are under, continue to undergird that civil disobedience and the quest for a truly um, democratic society, then we would probably see even less gains than we're seeing now. Jeff, you've talked about WOZA earlier. Tell me a little bit about how you see their actions and in how they're being responded to in South in uh, Zimbabwe. Yeah, was as, a, as Beatrice knows full well, having represented them a number of times um, in court. They're, they're an amazing organization. Um, they were founded in 2003 by, by two women who, who are still leading the organization today. And since their founding 11 years ago, I think the current count is um, the, the current director, Jenny Williams, has been arrested and detained over 50 times. So 50 times over a 10-year span, she's been imprisoned, detained, oftentimes beaten very brutally uh, and, and physically. Um, and it's the largest grouping, to my mind, having worked on the continent and in the region for a while, to my mind, it's the largest grassroots civic organization that, that I know of. It, it comprises mm -hmm. almost 80,000 80, women across the country, 90% um, women, 10% men. Uh, and it's fascinating. And you also, you do have women in leadership positions, even within the government. The current vice president uh, is a woman, though, if you've been following events in Zimbabwe, it's really interesting now where uh, President Mugabe's wife is now very front and center, putting her uh, face out there. She's on, currently on a, on a nationwide tour uh, where she's attacking the, the vice president, who happens to be a woman. So there's a lot of talk now that when the Zano PF Congress, Mugabe's party, happens uh, next month. In I December. thought you were going to say she was on a nationwide shopping tour because well, that's that been most of her yeah. <laughs> activity <laughs> she since she became she first does, lady. She does most of her shopping abroad. 
uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of rumblings now that a lot of the dominoes are, are falling into place where you might see um, the stage set for uh, uh, President Mugabe's wife to, to essentially take the reins of the country. Let me ask you, Beatrice, about that. There's so many questions I want to ask you, though, about the kinds of things that are going on that you've been challenging. Um, but in particular, I'm curious about the fact when I covered Zimbabwe, there was a, a burgeoning uh, alternative party that was, that was being formed to challenge the government. And they've had now, what, two or three times to do that. What, what's happening with those who see, see things as you do, constitutional you know, adherence to the Constitution and so forth? So are they gaining any strength and influence in the country? Well, I mean, for the first two elections, there can be no question that the opposition won and that uh, it was popular. That was um, uh, Morgan Changarai yes, and the, what yes. was the party called? Uh, the, 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 his party. MDC. MDC, yeah, Movement, yeah, Movement for, for Democratic Change. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, which probably is the reason why that, uh, you know, the violence uh, continued. But like most, parties in Africa, the MDC suffered from the founder syndrome when it became quite clear that a, a large portion of members of that party were not very happy with the leadership. The leader wouldn't even listen to, 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 to any changes in the structures. And the only change that he could think of was, you know, if you don't agree with the way I do things, I kick you out of my party. Uh, so even with that uh, formation, we saw that uh, the democracy perhaps uh, it wasn't playing out the way you expect an organization that calls itself a movement for democratic change to be adhering to any democratic principle. As a result, it is severely weakened because there was a split uh, uh, in 2005. There has then another breakaway party happened around 2008, 2009. And uh, this year, there has been a further split, which started last year. So we have as many MDC parties as uh, <laughs> they, 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 they are factions, really. And so we are seeing the one side trying to create some form of coalition, but I mean, I'm not uh, uh, confident that that will come up with anything meaningful anyway. Uh, it's, it's incredible uh, how when you look at um, oppressed people, how they tend to, to actually adopt what their oppressors did against them because these breakups we're talking about have been accompanied by violence, uh, the same party members beating each other up. The very same people that we were defending being beaten up were now beating each other up and they were now coming to us uh, saying, defend us against these guys, and I said, look guys, I'm sorry. I mean, if you guys are Democrats and you're being beaten up, that's the democratic way of doing things in your party, I'm not getting involved. Because for me, I've spent 15 years trying to defend these guys from the excesses of the, 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 the dominant party. And they're now doing exactly the same that has been happening. And talk about and, some of those excesses, because um, some of them are pretty egregious. Well, I mean, the, the enjoyment of pets that they give themselves, they were in the last government with the, the with Mugabe's government, and they, they were quite happy to, to have the <coughs> extravagant packs that go with, with being in power in Africa. The perks, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, they, 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 they were quite happy to take some of the things that they used to criticize when they are outside power as being unnecessary in a country like Zimbabwe where the economy is virtually on its knees. Uh, and of course, there were the personal indiscretions of some of the leadership that uh, made a, a lot of people wonder if uh, this is the type of leadership that, you, that, uh, that we want. I mean, with regards women, um, Jeff has referred to women of Zimbabwe arise, and they are indeed a formidable uh, you know, group to contend with. We have many, many women leaders in Zimbabwe in positions of authority. 
but they are there on terms dictated to by the men. And the men, of course, are not going to get powerful women to be in powerful positions because they want the kind of woman in those positions that they can control. What about the vice president? The vice president was put there by Robert Mugabe. She didn't get in there by being voted in there. But, I mean, we didn't mind that because she deserves it. She, she, she is a heroine of the Liberation War, and uh, we thought that this was uh, going to lead to her being a president. Now we have a constitution which says if something happens to Mugabe, the vice president becomes the president until the next elections. So it's quite obvious that they don't want her anywhere near there in case something happens and she becomes president. And the most incredible thing is that it is women who are in the forefront of saying, get rid of her, you know? And, and you say to yourself, if as women we can't even stand and say one of us should become president, the very same political leaders who really ought to be saying, as women we think we might rule better, they are the ones who are saying, as women we are failing. It's, it's uh, absolutely sad. Is, is there something though that creates this? Sarah, do you have any sense of that, something that would create what, what uh, uh, Beatrice is describing? I mean, you do have the women of Woza who are, who are strong in opposition, but is it the violence? Is it, what is it, do you think? Uh, in regards to women trying to remove other women from mm -hmm. power? Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to do rape crisis work, and as an attorney, I can tell you if you have a rape case, you do not want women on the jury. Women are incredibly judgmental of other women. Um, and it... it it's a challenge. So, you know, I don't know necessarily uh, why the movement is to uh, take Majuru out is being led predominantly by a lot of other women, other than um, Majuru has been around for quite a while. Um, and Grace is fairly clearly being backed by her husband um, in order to be making the push that she's making. So it might also just be, you know, a jumping on the bandwagon effort. Um, Majuru, uh, as Beatrice pointed out, got where she got because Mugabe put her there. And so you follow the one that is being backed by the power. And if it appears that she is not being backed anymore and Grace is the one being backed, then you just shift your allegiance because that's also where the perks will go. Um, but you know what is actually true. The underlying reason I, I mean I can't say Beatrice is the better authority to speak as somebody who's currently living there. Jeff, were you trying to say something? Yeah, like I was going to say I think the other point, the other important thing to consider when you're talking about the democratic movement and, and women in Zimbabwe, when you're living in a country in which eight out of ten are living on less than a dollar a day, oftentimes the you know and women are at home taking care of the families, you know, and their main concerns are where am I going to get water today? How am I going to put food in my, the stomachs of, of, my, of my children? How am, I, you know, how am I going to get these basic necessities? How are we going to have access to these basic services? So I think, obviously, their concerns are elsewhere. It's not on, you know, we can sit up here and talk about you know, democracy and, and, and liberty and freedom of expression and freedom of association, but what does that mean to the average woman right. on the ground? So part of my work and one of the issues I've been very much involved in is you know, making those, those linkages. So going to the rural areas and engaging with local communities to make, it, to, to make those connections between access to basic services and how that relates to good governance, how that relates to democracy. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. their main concerns are elsewhere. Their main concerns are hand to mouth and making it through the next day and that of their, of their children. So I think, I, I think energy is spent, is spent elsewhere and I think that might be the cause, one of the causes of that deficit that, that exists. Let me go back to Beatrice on another topic because you've alluded to this and, and those of you who are on this panel look at this kind of thing all the time. But give us some examples because I've heard you talk about some of the egregious violence against people in, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. You've been the subject of that kind of violence or the victim of that kind of violence yourself. But give us some examples of some of the kinds of things that the uh, ruling party and the government 
uh, perpetrates on people they deem as, as, uh, as uh, critics or e even people who just speak out. But give us some examples of some of that extreme violence, which isn't so extreme, actually, according to how often it happens. Tell us about some of it. Well, in the documentary, you see some of the victims uh, with the physical injury, injuries that, uh, you know, they would have suffered at the hands of, uh, of uh, the perpetrators of the violence. What kind of physical injuries? But they, 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 there is a lot of torture that, that goes on when you get arrested. Instead of being taken to a police station, you are taken to torture chambers where really a whole lot of things happen to you. Uh, uh, Justina Mkoko that uh, uh, Jeff referred to earlier on uh, is a peace activist who was abducted, in fact it was Sarah who referred to her, was abducted and for three weeks she was being tortured, uh, beaten up under the soles of her feet, being made to kneel on a, a, a concrete that was cutting on her knees, being uh, denied basic amenities and um, thankfully she was not raped. In 2000, I dealt with uh, uh, election violence because I brought a lot of the election petition challenges and the, the number of women that I interviewed who were traumatized because uh, their husbands uh, were, were members of the opposition, uh, uh, the numbers were incredible. I mean, the one woman's husband had been made to sit on a, on a hot stove so that half her bum half his bum was just cooked away. And she herself was uh, abducted and uh, she had a lock inserted into her private parts and uh, the men who were doing that then simulated sexual intercourse using the log. As a result, she had to have a hysterectomy because she was severely damaged by that. I mean, that, those are just some of those that I have uh, uh, personally uh, seen and they have been medically confirmed. A lot of the women in Zimbabwe where they've been sexually assaulted do not have the freedom to speak freely about that because it has a lot of consequences. Uh, 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 your husband can say, I don't want you because you've been raped, so go back to your home. So even where women have been sexually assaulted, they would actually rather not say it. And a lot of the women I've dealt with have said, can I speak to you in private? And they'll tell you, yes, this is what happened to me. This is, but I don't want it to come out publicly because if it does, my marriage might be at stake. So you can't prosecute. So, so, so you find you can't do much about that because I mean, if she's not willing to publicly say, this is what happened to me, you know, you can only rely on the violence of a physical nature where you can see where she was injured, even where there's very, very clear medical evidence of the sexual assault. They still would rather not. But even you had some exposure to torture when you were in arrested, right? Well, I've just been beaten up overnight. She just mean, been it beaten up. It <laughs> wasn't like the kind of torture where I'm kept away for weeks on end and I'm, you know, I mean, uh, the first two instances of, of my being beaten up, it was like the first one was just overnight and the second one, it was just over an hour and they were done with us, which, which is easier to deal with because, you know, you are then able to immediately go and get medical attention and also do whatever you think needs to be done. But for your majority of the victims, they are out in the rural areas. They have very little access to amenities or even to help. And uh, by the time they're able to get help, maybe it's a week later, and because of, so of the social issues that arise from some of these things, they don't have the freedom that I have to say, this is what has happened to me. I, I don't wanna dwell on this too long, but, but I think what is important to get into the psyche of Americans in particular is the extent 
of the of, of what is going on in these in countries like Zimbabwe. Now I'm sure it happens elsewhere. We might talk about that, but I just before I come to you, John, let me ask Sarah. You particularly look at the issue of torture, right? And it, tell us a little bit about what you're finding. Um, well, the political violence that occurred in the aftermath of 2008 uh, and the contested elections, Amnesty International documented 250 murders, 12,000 victims of violence, including torture, and 28,000 individuals displaced from their homes. As when you say torture, excuse me, what do you mean? Uh, <clears throat> it, it ran the gamut. Um, government state agents set up torture camps, uh, and a lot of these were in schools and rural areas, and individuals were forced to come to the camps. They had to sing songs that were in support of the government. Um, they were beaten, uh, the phalang, which is the beating of the soles of the feet. Um, when you hear it, it I mean, it, it kind of doesn't even sound that bad. Like, I don't understand what's happening. Um, but the soles of your feet are actually very tender. Um, and if you beat them repeatedly, uh, you can cripple somebody. Um, at the very least, make it impossible for them to walk for quite a period of time. Um, people beaten so severely that their skin was stripped away. Um, it was, there were document, documented cases of sexual violence. However, as Beatrice noted, um, it is completely unclear how much that occurred because people didn't want to disclose. Um, so just one hit with a club that was documented as one of the 12,000, because you were still beaten um, as a result of the, the election violence. So um, you know, there has been a long history from the Gukurahundi massacres in Montebelli land in the 80s, um, you know, through the, the colonial application, um, occupation. There's been a long history of impunity in Zimbabwe, um, where people are just not held to account. And so you can get away with doing whatever you want, including you know, what Beatrice noted in her opening story of the individuals who forced the woman to, uh, to walk through the townships naked, all the way through to you know, the president and um, you know, Mananagua and multiple others uh, who have committed pretty egregious crimes and are not held to account. There's quite a culture of impunity. Um, and Amnesty does do a lot of work on uh, torture, and we have worked on Zimbabwe on that issue, the US, multiple other countries. It's one of our largest campaigns. It, does anything happen as a result of your investigations and, and, and putting this out into the, into the public? Um, well, we've secured release of individuals from Guantanamo uh, because our government disclosed finally that they had committed torture and containing con, uh, obtaining confessions. Um, but we have pushed governments to ratify the Convention Against Torture and have had a lot of success with that. Unfortunately, not Zimbabwe. Um, they are not a signatory of the Convention Against Torture. Um, but we have pushed and done a lot of work. So there is a section in the new constitution which states that, um, I think it's section 53, that you have the right to be free from torture, cruel, and inhumane treatment. Um, so you, know, you keep pushing at it, and you just don't stop. And hopefully, eventually, we will have a world where we don't see torture. John, you wanted to say something? I, I did want to say a, a, a brief word about progress, because I don't want us to be naive and, and celebrating the tenacity <coughs> and courage of, of Beatrice and Tetwa. But the 2013 election was peaceful on the day of election, as opposed to it was the, the situation. In Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. as opposed to the situation in 2008. Now, my former CEO, John Hardman, is here and will remember that the Carter Center did not observe either election because we couldn't get enough political space in a situation that would be conducive to observing. However, the African Union and the SADC regional bloc did observe, and what they've been pressing Explain for... Explain the SADC regional bloc. SADC is a Southern African development uh, community. They send their governmental representatives because they were really concerned about the spillover effect of violence on election day, even though there was a lot of hidden violence in, ad in advance of the election. This is a complicated game that's evolving with the willingness of African states to increasingly get involved in the internal affairs of other African states. I've watched this over my lifetime. It's going too slowly, but progress is being made. What the Carter Center does, and with Georgia Tech's help, and I want to stress the fact that your Georgia Tech contribution to the processes of opening up a greater understanding of the hypocrisy, the evil hypocrisy of, say, Mugabe, who wants to pretend that he signs up to all these international obligations and then performs differently. What Georgia Tech has given us is a software 
that would allow us in our election observations, when we can get in and observe, and there's pressure on governments to let more and more observers in, to look at the gap between the rhetoric and the principles of international law and the performance. And as you process that data and you can build a case, what we're finding is that the African Union and SADC, for their own self-interests, are increasingly willing to be a little bit more Beatrice, not as much as we would like, but a little bit more pressuring on the governments that are holding <clears throat> these kind of events to stop the repression because the violence spills over to the neighbors, creates the refugee problems. There is progress underway, and so I wouldn't want to leave this conversation, Charlene, as you know, without encouraging those students in the audience to think that there's something to work on here going forward. Okay, I, I've written about uh, countries on the entire uh, continent, 48 or 54, however you want to count them, uh, taking baby steps to democracy. And that we need to, as you're encouraging us to be a little more understanding and patient. But how long, I mean, we look at our own history and how long it no took, kidding. but I don't want to go Take there him. now. That's not what we're going to talk about. But are we expecting too much? Or in this day and age, should these democracies be getting into their more mature steps and observing constitutional guarantees? Are we expecting too much? Well, I never expected South Africa to become a constitutional democracy where the rule of law still prevails. If Jacob Zuma changes the constitution or the ANC was to abrogate the protections that are based on the rule of law in South Africa, and there's a danger of that, there's always a danger of that, then I would despair. I, I am optimistic about the willingness of African states to hold increasingly each other more accountable for their own reasons. But the role of civil society, as the members of this panel have reminded us, and we remind ourselves at the Carter Center all the time, have to be an integral part of this. And having a voice like Beatrice and Tetwe remind us of our obligations in this regard. There was a comment by Mary Robinson last week that when men meet. With the elders. When the elders, when men meet, they talk about the sharing of power. When women meet, they talk about the sharing of responsibilities. And, and I think that's a very nice way to think about what I think we all collectively share, but all we can do is keep pushing at the margins. Well, let me ask you this, I though. I, I'll come to you in one second, but you talked about this landmark ruling in South Africa. Yes. Uh, that South Africa can prosecute yes. uh, people who've come to, to, to who are in South, South Africa, Africa from Zimbabwe. who committed crimes yeah. in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Uh, but how has the, South Africa's role been in, term, in, in its relationship to Zimbabwe other than this? I mean, this is landmark. This is great. But ha has it been as strong as it could be in, in pressuring, or as the South Africans say, pressurizing uh, Zimbabwe to get a grip. No, and, you know. and, and you know, and I know, going back history, and I won't belabor this now, but when the initial events happened after 2000, South Africa's got a land problem just like Zimbabwe. And by the way, if Ronald Reagan hadn't won in 1980, I've had Zimbabweans tell me that Jimmy Carter would have done the land uh, willing buying, willing seller, and it might have been a different history. So, but explain what you're okay. talking about. Well, I'm, what I'm talking about is that that there was a vital national interest to South Africa not to have the land issue become polarized and led to escalating racial tensions within, within in 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 South Africa. That's and the and that means giving the so they were using re re kid gloves covering the land for the right. They were using majority. kid gloves, mm -hmm. and, and 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 frankly, my fear. I've got to say this about America's stakes in this region, I worried that the race war in South Africa in the 1980s was going to polarize race relations in this country of the United States of America. That was our vital interest, even though Henry Kissinger wanted us to believe that it was a Simon Towns strategic base in the Slarks and, and the East-West confrontation. So these are ongoing struggles that we have in finding that balance between human rights and sovereign rights. But South Africa's role is what as, I particularly South Africa's asked you role about. has been to be not as assertive as you and I would have liked and preferred. But what we see in this constitutional court decision two weeks ago is another step in the right direction, which America cannot take, by the way, because we don't belong to the International Criminal Court, because our legislature won't allow us 
to, in fact, join the international community in a more progressive stand. Jeff, you wanted to say, and I'm coming to you, Yeah, Bish. just like 30 seconds. 30 seconds, um, and I then think it's, I think it's really important to remember that peaceful does not mean free, fair, and credible. And unfortunately, the term peaceful has become the gold standard for elections in, in Southern Africa, and I would argue Africa writ large. And at the same time, uh, there is some progress being made. Who's the current chairperson of the Southern African Development Community? It's President Mugabe. Who's the incoming chair of the African Union? It's President Mugabe. So while there are some small steps being made, I, I think you know, there are some serious problems that persist. And then to answer your question, I think, no, it's not, it's not, we're not asking enough. And I think it's insulting to Africans writ large to say, um, you know, we should hold them to, to similar standards. If you right. look at every single survey, even the most recent survey by Afrobarometer, which by all, according, you know, across the board is one of the most uh, highly respected institutions in Africa. Seven out of 10 Africans across the continent say they want democracy and they think it's the best form of government. There's been a 15% increase of the composite index demand for democracy in Africa, a 15% increase over the past 10 years. So they're yearning for this, but you have people in power that are, that are stopping mm -hmm. that from happening. And I think it's very, very dangerous to, to, to equate peaceful with free, fair, and credible. That's because true. Because by all accounts, the 2013 things. elections last year in Zimbabwe were fundamentally rigged from the outset. It was, it was a selection, not an election. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted really to say that an election is a process. It's not just an right. event on the day of the elections. Yep. And what happens, you know, leading to the election is as important as what happens on the day that the elections take place. In Zimbabwe, for instance, the other political parties fought and fought and fought, and up to today they have not had access to the electronic voters' role, which determines whether or not people who are <coughs> supposed to vote are actually on the voters' roll and, 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 and whether they actually are the persons who are said to have voted. And that, that's absolutely crucial if you are going to have democratic elections. That hasn't happened. The space leading up to the elections uh, for those who are not in control of state apparatus was simply not there. If you turned on the only television station in Zimbabwe, which is state controlled, you would only see one political party. So just access to the electorate wasn't there. And uh, despite the law saying they should cover everybody, you know. So the, the, the fact that no blood was spilled on election day does not on its own really translate, as Jeff says, to free and fair elections. But more importantly, SADC itself, that Southern African grouping, has basic minimum standards on how elections should be conducted. And there ought to be you know, a ticking of the boxes of the minimum that they've agreed to as a body. They don't give reference to, 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 to that. And Zimbabwe has only been able to be compliant on those principles on just regularity mainly. Yeah. You know, they hold elections every five years. But whether or not all the other principles are adhered to is never interrogated by any of the leaders in the region. And it's for a good reason because, you know, if you say my elections are not free and fair, and next year you are having your elections and my guys are coming to, 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 to observe your elections, of course you want my, elect I want my elections to be free and fair. <laughs> so you have this trade union of leaders that is really looking after each other's interests in the region with absolutely no regard to what they themselves have, have, have agreed to. Mm. Uh, I just refer briefly to this, to the case that Dr. Stremler has referred to where the Constitutional Court in South Africa has forced the South African government kicking and screaming one of the organizations that brought that case is one in which I'm involved, I, I'm a trustee on that. We brought that application many, many years ago. Yes, 2008. Starting with the government, and it is the government that appealed at every turn because they did not want this to happen. It is only the constitutional court that is going to, that has forced the South African hand to do it. But politically, there has been no will to deal with perpetrators of violence in Zimbabwe when they go to South Africa, despite the fact that South Africa is a signatory to the Rome Statute that says anyone who commits human rights abuses elsewhere when they are in your jurisdiction, deal with them. 
they have not wanted to deal with them, and they are being forced by the courts to do it. Uh, I'm not so sure that in 20 years' time we can even get that kind of decision from the Constitutional Court in South Africa, because you can see the attempts at weakening the, cons the judiciary even in South Africa as we speak. We what, about the, what about the quid pro quo she just described, John, that, that the African leaders in the surrounding countries are ensure, uh, uh, affirming the, South, uh, the Zimbabwean elections because they don't want them coming there uh, uh, casting aspersions on their own elections. Do you see that when you go and observe? Of, of, of course. There's nothing that we disagree in, but what Beatrice's genius has been is to find that space when she can operate within Zimbabwe. And what we're also seeing at the regional level is an opening of a political space which is not as large as we would like, but if I believe my colleagues at the Electoral Institute for Southern Africa, now the Electoral Institute for Sustainable Democracy in, in, in uh, Africa, ISA, they provide technical assistance for the African Union delegations of election observations, and their standards are rising faster than the ECOWAS or the SADC, the regional, sub-regional RECs, or regional organizations. There is a dynamic going on which is not as fast as we would like, but there's something that is changing that is making it more and more transparent and accountable as a criteria for having neighbors taking care of neighbors. I wish I could say it a little less romantically than that, but that's the way that I think the pragmatic politics and the idealistic ideals that we all uh, aspire to may be converging, but we have to work at it all the time. And that's why non-governmental organizations like the Carter Center and uh, and amnesty uh, uh, or, the, or the Kennedy Center are really important. All right, we're, we're talking about elections now, but I want to go back to something Sarah raised earlier. Uh, and I think Zimbabwe is, uh, has been joined by any number of African countries on the issue of LBGT rights, uh, lesbian, gay, um, you know, homosexual uh, rights. What, what are you seeing in that regard there? Uh, it's, it's very serious in, in, in Zimbabwe, is that not right? Um, there's actually other countries where the, the crisis is, is much worse. Um, there is a, an organization in Zimbabwe called Gay and Lesbians of Zimbabwe Gauls, um, and they are predominantly targeted around election times as a way, again, to amp up the rhetoric. Uh, they were one of the many organizations that were targeted between the end of 2012 and the middle of 2013 when the elections occurred, where offices were raided, they were arrested. Um, but a lot of the time, there's just this sort of low-level um, disdain and disregard for the LGBT population in Zimbabwe as opposed to an actual targeting. Uh, the laws against um, homosexuality are not often um, implemented or prosecuted in Zimbabwe. Um, but we've seen quite a rise in other countries. Uh, we're particularly concerned about uh, Cameroon, Uganda, Nigeria. Um, the Gambia is also in the process of uh, increasing the penalties on their legislation for um, homo engaging in homosexual um, relationships. Uh, in Nigeria, we've seen a lot of mob mentality, a lot of attacks of people who are either gay or perceived as gay or who are allies. Um, so there has definitely been a push um, and a, an, an effort to further marginalize a population. And, Amnesty characterizes it um, under our anti-discrimination uh, campaigns, where it's just a yet another level um, of discrimination that occurs against a group that has been marginalized culturally and historically. And if I could speak to that, we cannot leave out the role that the Western religious right plays in it, in investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into the, the churches, the rhetoric around that, supporting anti-gay um, organizing movement efforts. And so that's another example of our, how our um, intervention in this, or I can say meddling in this, really is fueling yet some additional human rights violations of these groups. You have a comment on that, Jeff? I was, it's, it's really interesting, too, as Sarah was saying, you know, they, these leaders in these countries couch this vitriolic rhetoric in like anti-colonial populist terms, particularly around elections. But if you look closer, <laughs> a lot of the laws in which they use to criminalize uh, same-sex same -sex consensual conduct, it's colonial era uh, laws, colonial era sodomy laws, uh, and, and, and what have you. So it's, it's really interesting. They don't even realize the, the hypocrisy in which you know, the, the, these words that they're speaking, you know, really you know, pounding their fists on the table, saying this is you know, Western incursions into our culture, 
um, when in fact the, the very means with which they used to criminalize this is colonial era laws that are still on the books. It's, and I, I think we have to often remind them, <laughs> remind them of that. Right, I think it was in Uganda where there was an extremely progressive uh, response to the LBGT population, and then when the religious right came in, exactly. it, it managed to take it from up here down to here somewhere. Exactly. Let's go back to something, I think, was it you, John, who talked about U.S. policy uh, towards Zimbabwe. Uh, how would you assess it, and should, we, should the United States be doing more? I'm not advocating the use of drones, like this because I, <laughs> I, I commented upon afterwards. I was just drawing attention to the fact that the military instrument is used very frequently by the United States. And in the case of Zimbabwe, it would seem like there would be more of a need to be more interventionist in a political sense. I don't want to take away from the hard work of embassies and others that have been over the years trying to pressure Mugabe, but they are sensitive given that the geostrategic stakes are not deemed by Washington to be that high to the regional opinion. So you have people lining up behind Sadek, and Mugabe's very skillful at playing that game. And he will send over a Beatrice and Tetwe just to show that it's really not that bad in Zimbabwe. But fortunately, she's able to navigate those waters and enlighten us. Well, let's be clear. He didn't send her over here. <laughs> he, allowed he allowed her, her to come to out. Come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just bri briefly before we go to the audience, and you guys get ready, and ladies get ready for your questions, but do you have a, a, a comment on U.S. policy towards Zimbabwe, what it's doing right and what it's doing, could be doing? <laughs> well, I just found the policy from the Western developed world towards Zimbabwe a bit difficult to follow because when it became clear that the country was going off the rails, there wasn't, you know, the kind of uh, response that we thought should, should, should be there. And when, you know, the Western world became critical of Zimbabwe, it was when there were the farm invasions. Uh, so clearly, yes. the impression that was created out there was that, oh, you are now talking about Mugabe because he's taking land from your Moist. kith and kin. And it's played very, very, very much on that because it was like, it's, it's wild and the villages were being murdered. You know, it was no big deal. But now that white farmers are under attack, you know, <laughs> we'll sanction you, we'll do this. And it has not helped the ordinary Zimbabwean who bears the brunt of the everyday excesses. Because if you look at, uh, and, and I think the media was also largely to blame for that because instead of dealing with the human catastrophe that the farm invasions created by way of dealing with the farm workers, thousands of black Zimbabweans whose entire livelihoods were on the farmland, nobody even wrote about them. Nobody cared about them. I Maybe did. Maybe you did. <laughs> but the point is that the majority of people did not understand that this land was being taken on the pretext that it would be given to black Zimbabweans, but hundreds of black Zimbabweans were being evicted from those very same farms. Why did the law not say that the farm workers take the farms and run them? Because firstly, they had the expertise. You know, I mean, if you took me to a farm now and gave it to me, I wouldn't know what to do. But those farm workers were the ones running the farms. So I think uh, the. The foreign policy has been very difficult for me, certainly, to understand because it hasn't been consistent. It has not been clear what it is meant to achieve. And uh, we, 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 we have seen interventions that sometimes are contradictory. And uh, if you ask me, I truly don't know what the foreign policy is. I was hoping Zimbabwe. you could tell me what it was because I, I don't know. I'm in DC and I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Also, a lot of those farms were given to Mugabe's cronies yes. oh, as yeah. well. All right, and I said we would open this up to some questions, and if you have them, would you please stand, identify yourself, and speak? I don't know if there's a mic out there. Yeah, there's a mic out there. Thank you. Sure. My name is Al Bartell, and I um, am a certified mediator for neighborhoods and communities here in Atlanta to work with uh, state, local, uh, and federal governments, and we're in partnership with the <clears throat> Ivan Allen School of Liberal Arts. Uh, the dean herself has come over to our neighborhoods and communicated about the need for that kind of partnership. And it's the kind of partnership my question 
is about partnership with the diaspora. You know, those of us who live in America, particularly those of us who are African Americans, are interested in being a part of the foreign policy dialogue. Uh, there are those of us who say that we in the diaspora are not doing enough, that we depend on our public policy bodies, bodies of U.S. Congress and so forth. So my question is, can you, uh, uh, Ms. Mtetwa, and you too, John, communicate about the role of the diaspora in beginning to reshape our relationship with foreign policy here in the West? Beatrice? Well, I don't know what influence you'd have in shaping your foreign policy, but I think as individual organizations, there's a lot of room for collaboration. I mean, I went through the center yesterday and I, I saw the, the, the civil rights movement, you know, uh, in, in a perspective that I'd never seen before. And I think if we, we had mentorship programs where actually our young people could come and see that this is a process. You don't just do something today and you get all the rights tomorrow and that there's pain along the way. If they could come and they get mentored by the relevant organizations and they could come back and see that actually it is worth fighting this you know, cause because in the long term, the gains will be there. They may be small, you may not completely eradicate you know, some of the problems that we have all over the world, but if you just can create a, a, an atmosphere where people can enjoy basic rights, enjoy a basic standard of living, it would have been worth it, and that more of us should do that. So I would encourage a lot of mentorship, because if we rely on governments and foreign policy, there's a whole lot more at stake there and very different uh, considerations. And I think that Beatrice made the point yesterday uh, when she talked with a group of women leaders here in Atlanta that a lot of the young people in Zimbabwe today don't see the relevance of really getting involved and, st and staying the course. And, and she was saying that she thought that that could be something taught here about how the American civil rights leaders, especially the young ones stayed the course. Uh, next question. Is there another question? Yes, ma'am, over here. Can you wait till we get the mic over there? It's a mic there. There's another one. Oh, there is one. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess you're going to have to raise your hands a lot higher so that the people with the mics can <laughs> see you. Okay. Uh, my name is Olga Shemekina. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Economics. Can you hold it a little closer? To uh, I'm an my name is Olga Shemekina. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Economics, and my research focuses on civil wars and the um, effect of civil wars on population. Can you just speak a little more about how political repression and its effect on population differs from effect of, let's say, liberation movement or a civil war? Um, I mean, how does it affect population in general? It does affect human rights activists and people who fight against the government, but um, what are the broader impacts? I mean, uh, is there differential impacts? Yeah. Oh, you were shaking your sure, head. Yeah. That's why no, I called on you. <laughs> I think the, the, the context of Zimbabwe is really interesting because you know, you've had one person in one particular political party have 34 years to consolidate power. So Robert Mugabe is ZANU-PF. <coughs> ZANU-PF is the state. They're, there's, they, they're completely interlocked and, and intertwined. And I think the way in which they've been able to sort of, um, you know, through these various ways, um, repress the entire country is that, um, you know, th through those means. And when we're talking about Gukurahundi, the what someone called genocide that happened in the early 80s and the massive electoral violence that happened in the early 2000s and particularly post-2008, and as I said in my initial remarks at the podium, you've, you've seen a, a shift from that because these leaders like Mugabe are, are clever. You know, they don't have to go out and necessarily beat people over the head with, you know, baton-wielding security agents and police. They send military officials to your neighborhood before election saying, you know what happened to your family members back during the last election? We're still here. We're still in power. And as Sarah was saying, a lot of these same people are still in power. So Emerson Menengagwa, who is the current uh, justice minister of all things, was the former defense minister who perpetrated perpetrate the genocide and many of these other horrible, horrible things that happen in the country. So when you still see these people in power, all they have to do is harvest the fear. They just go out into the countryside 
and say, you remember what happened last time, we're still here, we're still in power, and we can still inflict this pain on you. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah, um, you know, the, the huge difference that we have here in Zimbabwe also is that, as Jeff says, the entire state machinery is controlled from one center. You can't say, I'm going to rush to the courts for protection because that protection depends on the political players. You know, if, if, if they don't want you to get to court, you may not get to court. You know, if, if you do get to court, they can engineer the case in such a way that it is placed before a certain judge who will guarantee a certain result. And, and as Jeff says also, the, 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 some of the repression is very, very subtle in that they will not be physical with you. I had a young lawyer a couple of years ago who went to the police station to get some of uh, the activists uh, to interview them. Uh, and the policeman said, oh, you're here. We know where your kids go to school. If you want to continue with this kind of work, you know what can happen to them. He came back and he was gone within a week. They didn't touch him, but I mean, when somebody says, we know where your kids go to school, what more do they need to say to you? That's just so frightening. And uh, he can't do anything about it. And, and so they, they deliberately ensure that the space is, 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 is less and less for purposes of, uh, you know, even the civil society activists, uh, you know, intervening. Sarah? Um, so just in terms of the, the economics, so the Civil War happened in Zimbabwe in the context of the Liberation War in the, you know, through the 70s. Um, and since then, there hasn't been a war. Um, and the government and the economy actually functioned fairly well up until 2000. But the backbone of the economy was the agricultural industry. And when that collapsed through the uh, non-use of the farms and so many of them going fallow, the knock-on economic effect is what you're currently seeing, where there are, I think there are up to nine different official currencies that are accepted in Zimbabwe because there is no official Zimbabwean currency anymore. Um, in 2008, uh, 2006, 2007, and 2008, um, when the famine situation was so bad, it's hard to mobilize somebody to step up and step out against their government when they are eating twigs and leaves. And when, as a parent, you have to make the decision that day, do I feed myself such that I might have the strength and the energy to try to go find work tomorrow and then have enough money to feed my children, or do I feed my children today and not have them suffer from malnutrition, and then I'm not, weak, you know, I'm not strong enough to go try to find work tomorrow? When you're making those basic fundamental life decisions, it's very hard to mobilize to speak out against your government. And the Mugabe regime has used that effectively as a method to control. There's, you know, state resources are not used to build the schools up to provide adequate pay for teachers. The um, medical industry has collapsed. The infrastructure has collapsed. In 2008, when the cholera epidemic occurred and 4,000 people died needlessly of a disease that is treatable, it's because the infrastructure had collapsed. And this is part of the knock-on effect of the Murambatsvina, where 700,000 people were displaced. This is the same thing as taking the city of Detroit, which arguably has already happened, and just eliminating it. You know, 700,000 people. And this is their homes and their livelihoods. And they're dispersed in the rural areas and forced into these makeshift townships where there's not adequate sewage and ways to manage it. And so people are forced to you know, scavenge drinking water where they can get it. And then the rains came in, which then mixed the, where they were going with inadequate latrines with a way to get their drinking water. And you had a cholera epidemic. I mean, there's, these are the knock-on effects that not necessarily have to do with the actual civil war, but from a government that consolidated itself after a liberation movement and then focused on consolidating those resources for themselves at the sake of their population. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to remember. Up until 2000, Zimbabwe was, an, was a net exporter of food. They were feeding the continent, mm -hmm. essentially. And now you're, we're in a situation now where two and a half million people are in dire need of emergency food assistance from the UN World Food Program. So it's, you've seen, that's one of the tragedies. You know, it was, it was lauded as a success story to now the, the state that we see it in today. 
Let me take about three more questions from the audience, and then I'd like to have our panel wrap up. Is that good for you, Dr. Dean? I'm, I, I got marching orders up here, so I want to be sure I don't offend the dean. <laughs> uh, in the back, is that, who is that? Yeah. Uh, I'm Ken Knespel. I'm a professor in the Ivan Allen College. Beatrice and perhaps other members of the panel, would you describe the consequences of Chinese and Russian investment in Zimbabwe? And, and as you do that, address the U.S. policy, because I, my experience in all of these countries is that increasingly, as a, while Americans are insisting on commitments to human rights, the Chinese don't have a care about that in the world. And as a result, the Chinese seem to be really moving in all over the continent uh, and not requiring governments to adhere to human rights standards. Bishop, you want to comment well, on that? Well, in Zimbabwe, we have had an official look east policy for- Look east? Yes. Uh, by the government, uh, which basically said that we, you can, you know, stay with your, 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 your sanctions in the West. We are going to deal with our all-weather friends in the East, meaning basically China. So we've had Chinese coming to invest in Zimbabwe for, for the past decade, certainly, and they've been given large tracts of, uh, of, of, of mining concessions, uh, but unfortunately we've not seen the benefit uh, of, 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 of those investments, because firstly, I think all of you know that when the Chinese come to town, they bring even their own wheelbarrow, they bring their sweeper, they will not offer employment to any local. So, you know, that investment is, 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 is not going to create any employment anyway, because they, they cut these deals where they are able to bring everybody uh, from, from China. Uh, you also know that the labor practices that they, 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 they engage in are not the normal labor practices that you, you expect. And in fact, more often than not, they, 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 they don't comply with the, the local labor laws. Uh, so you have that problem of, of, of them that even if they, they do employ a few locals, they will not pay them even the minimum wage. And Zimbabwe has minimum wage across uh, uh, different sectors. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, China really doesn't care about human rights compliance. I mean, uh, you know, they will not insist on certain basic standards before they can invest. And uh, because of that also, it follows that they really will not be bothered about ensuring that they run operations that are transparent. Uh, I mean, we have them involved in our diamond industry, and nobody knows what has happened to the diamonds they've been mining since they got the concessions. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, an area of concern. But uh, in the last two, three months, they also have been jittery because it is not clear who's going to be in power post Mugabe. And therefore, there's the fear that, you know, even they cannot invest as they've been doing, and uh, a whole lot of investments uh, that were promised about three months ago when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when the, a delegation went to, to, to China, all of those are, are generally on hold now. We have Russia that has entered the fray. Mm -hmm. We had a big Russian delegation about uh, eight weeks ago who also have promised to invest in, uh, in, 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 in Zimbabwe. And you can see the kind of friendships that we are keeping and how they probably will not give a damn if you clobber your people from time to time. John, are you seeing this around the Chinese influence around the rest of the continent? And what is the impact of that on democratic principles and governance? It's a big subject, Charlene, and I'm trying to think of a quick way to give some insights uh, because it's not a simple picture. When we sent an observation mission to Madagascar, there was the Chinese observer mission functioning ostensibly the same way as the rest of us Democrats are functioning. We know that in Africa today, this is again a subject for, for future student work at Georgia Tech, 
there is this alternative authoritarian capitalist market that challenges the liberal democracy, rule of law, messy process of self-correcting, slow evolving political systems that Beatrice Mentekwe and we all are advocating. And so how do you make sure that our alternative has greater force? America's greatest strength is its soft power. This gets back to the diaspora question that was raised earlier. The fact that you have assistant secretaries of state from the United States who are African American, who have come through and have absolutely clear eyes about the realities of American history, and they can advocate for democracy and rule of law, and no person is above the law, gives added force. Would this country support them more strongly? That would be fine. But it took a diaspora community to package up Solomon um, Northrop's memoir and make it compelling to Americans to shed a new light on our own history. So it is a very slow and messy process to challenge a China that it's much more quick to respond and intervene, but is itself going through its own internal dilemmas and problems. And that's what, of course, by the way, the Carter Center tries to do is to open up both of those those areas and to have a project on Africa that would involve Chinese and Americans talking with Africans about how do we move forward together because there is no possibility of a conflict over this. That would be too horrendous to contemplate. But even as China is beginning to have its own economic problems, how is that going to affect its performance in Africa, do you think, Jeff? No, it'll definitely be interesting to watch. You know, it's it's not just only their involvement in Zim, but a, across the continent. As, we, as we've been talking about, they just helped build the new African Union um, headquarters in, in Ethiopia. They just helped build a new parliament in, in Harare. I believe they built their military war college uh, in Zimbabwe. When you travel through the rural areas, it's really interesting. In the region, you see Chinese vendors on the streets in these, you know, these backwoods places that you would never, never expect to see them. So it goes really deep. And, I really want to touch 20 seconds on the point that Beatrice made about um, diamonds in Zimbabwe. Recently, in 2006, they discovered the largest alluvial diamond field in the world. So it's a gift, a gift to ZANU-PF and Mugabe. And the Chinese came in in a joint venture with the Zimbabwean military called the Zimbabwe Mining Development Corporation. And I've seen estimates, I don't know about you, Beatrice, uh, estimates about as high as a billion dollars um, that has already been, uh, including potential and, and diamonds that have already been mined from that area. But out of that one potential $1 billion, only $45 million has actually passed through Treasury. So where's that money going? Right. You know, and, and clearly, not clearly, I would argue that it's probably going in the hands of the Chinese and of ZANU-PF military, military leadership. Aren't they providing planes also, fighter planes? Russia is. Russia is, yeah. 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 I, said two more, I said three. Have we done two? And I think we have one more over there and here. Two more, one here and one there. She's got the mic in her hand. Oh, well, I was calling on you, but you can go and then you. Um, I want to thank the panel for their views and uh, particularly Beatrice for her courage. Uh, my name is Dixon Nosegbe. I'm actually an undergraduate here at Georgia Tech. I'm a Nigerian. And uh, my question to you, Beatrice, is um, we have a huge African community um, across the schools here in Atlanta and you know, all across the United States. Um, using Nigeria as a case study, like the political terrain is that we have political rulers who keep recycling themselves you know, over and over again. And it's actually very hard for the youths you know, to think that they can actually contribute to the development of the country you know, because we have people who have ruled the countries in the 70s and then they still come, uh, keep coming back. So my question is, what advice do you have for the youths, that's particularly African youths, and how we can contribute and you know, make our impact back home? That's you. Well, I mean, if the youth can organize themselves and, uh, and be a force to be reckoned with, we've seen youths in other parts of the world actually being uh, the catalyst for change by really demanding to be heard as a matter of right. And I think in Nigeria, certainly, that should be possible because I don't think you have the kind of restrictions that uh, we have uh, in, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, there's absolutely no political will in Africa to let young people be heard. Uh, young people like women are deemed not to have those rights. And I think it's up to the youths 
to demand those rights in the same way that youths have demanded those rights uh, elsewhere and demand the rights for themselves, not just to say we want to change one old man for another. Youths must have a role to play in the country's affairs like every other uh, grouping. All right, two quick more. Would you? Yes, my name is Katja Weber. I'm a professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. Uh, what you described for Zimbabwe reminds us of several other places in the world. Um, I take students to Southeast Asia, so the country that comes to my mind, for instance, is Cambodia. There, the Prime Minister Hun Sen has been in power for many years, clear connections to Khmer Rouge, um, brutal crackdowns on protesters. So my question to the panel, given the spread of social media, are um, you aware of interactions between civil society groups in Zimbabwe and let's say Cambodia or Zimbabwe and Myanmar? Do these interactions exist? Deborah, do you have a comment on that? Yes, and Kaz, from the when you look at social movements and what works and what sustains itself, uh, certainly social media is an important tool to spark awareness, but we have yet to see how it's been used effectively to sustain ongoing resistance. Uh, I think the Arab Springs is a great example of how there was a lot of promise mm -hmm. around the role of social media there, but because of this, um, not being a tool for long-term organizing resistance, that it hasn't brought about the changes that we desire to have happen. I have to say, I saw on CNN this morning that ISIS is recruiting uh, people through social media. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> you had one final question here. About China, but, uh, uh, let's I'll have your. Huh? I'll, I'll change it to. Um... Uh, let's get the mic over here, please. <laughs> Is there one? And then we're going to close with one quick round of the panel. Uh, trying to end on a positive note, you talk about how to get the youth uh, movement, and then there are some positive things that you've been mentioning, including having labor laws that have minimum wage for, for workers. What are positive things that someone in power has implemented over the last 25 years that could be built upon to actually um, create a movement, um, like you mentioned? If you don't mind, I'll take your question and, and put it into my final question because the dean is looking at me. Uh, so given what he has just uh, asked, let, let me go back to the dean's words uh, at the beginning of this session where she talked about hope emerging and prevailing. Now, Beatrice, aside from you and the people who work around you, do you see any hope at all and where do you see it coming from? And if you don't, be honest about that too. Well, Zimbabwe has a brand new constitution which has fantastic provisions, it covers the youths, full participation, full participation by women, talks of all the second generation rights, you know, right to health, all the things that were not there in the initial constitution. So for me, I'm thinking we can build on that. And by ensuring that what the Constitution says is complied with. And I've already started working on challenges where I believe that, you know, uh, 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 women are not getting what the Constitution says they should say. And I think the youth should also demand the rights that the Constitution says they have. And it's pointless talking of economic empowerment in the Constitution when there's no infrastructure or even just a, a, an act of parliament that deals with how you will empower these women. So I am looking at that, this new Constitution as a positive tool that we can use to demand transparency in how our resources are being uh, used. And whether those resources should be used actually to empower everyone across the board even through the use of, of, of the law. Jeff, where do you see hope if you see any? Especially I, as it relates to Zimbabwe, but maybe to... Yeah, I think the point in the Constitution is, uh, is an excellent point. I was reading an article in the domestic press in Zimbabwe last night, and they're just now, not to say they haven't done it before, the government, but they've, they've undertaken this Constitution awareness campaign. But this was, you know, it's been 20 months since the Constitution has been in place, since it was passed by referendum. And as Beatrice was saying, you have these wonderful, wonderful things there. You have a gender commission, an anti-corruption commission, a human rights commission. Uh, but to my knowledge, they're all, they're sitting there in name. They exist in name only, 
and, and that's it. You know, Africa, the Sadic region in particular, is replete with beautifully written conventions and treaties. The principles and guidelines that govern democratic elections, for instance, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that very much mirrors the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So when these leaders like Mugabe stand up and say these are Western values, these are Western norms, we know that's nonsense because if you compare the Universal Declaration and the African Charter, they're very, very similar. And I think um, it's a matter of holding them to, to their words. You know, it's a matter of implementation. These things exist, but we have to start we have to start implementing them. And I think that's where the role of South Africa comes in. That's where the role of these regional powerhouses come in, the Ghanas, the Senegals, the South Africans, these relatively well-performing democratic states that aren't playing the leadership roles that they should be. Instead, countries like South Africa are supplying the ZANU-PF regime with electronic monitoring devices and how to monitor people on Facebook going to your question on social media. So that's the problem. And I think part of it, the US bit, it's, it's up to us too to stand with these people. We shouldn't be standing with the likes of President Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, who's been in power for 35 years. Uh, standing with the likes of Eduardo Dos Santos, the president of Angola, who's been in power for 34 years. We should be standing with the Jacob Zumas, the, the, the Ian Kamas of Botswana, and the, the President Mohamas of Ghana. These are the people that are doing really great things on the continent, but sort of get lost in the mix of these repressive countries. Deborah? Um, certainly it's the belief and, the, and really the impetus around the Center for Civil and Human Rights to lift up the fact that it's we the people that brings about social change. It's people working together for collective action. And you heard Charlene mention earlier that there was a group of women leaders that Dean Royston and I convened yesterday to meet with Beatrice. And we have pledged that we want and will use the resources of the center to provide the mentorship that she's talking about. So the young people of um, Zimbabwe will be informed and encouraged by not only the young people 50 years ago who were part of the American Civil Rights Movement, but young people throughout the world who are doing great works to bring about the change that we seek. Sierra? Uh, when I was teaching, um, I would have students who were in their early 20s and they would just say, the world is so horrible, it's so horrible. Um, and it does seem so horrible when you're in your early 20s and you don't have the ability to look back and see through this like longer channel of history where for my grandparents, the concept of human rights didn't even exist. You know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is only 60 years old. Um, so if you look back at where we have come globally in that time frame, we are moving in actually leaps and bounds. And when you're in the midst of it, it seems like you are moving in the minutia um, at a glacial pace through ooze and it's just not going anywhere. But we are moving and we are making differences and it's important that we raise up voices like Beatrice, uh, not only just in events like this, but you know, in every opportunity and every venue you can. So these people realize that they are supported and that they're heard and that their work is acknowledged and that we do what we can to keep them safe um, and that we keep pushing forward. So human rights does matter and it does make change and we are moving forward. And so for me, my concept of hope is not just in Zimbabwe, um, where you even have somebody who is the minister of justice uh, who has committed very serious, there are allegations of very serious crimes that he's committed, but he is against the death penalty. So Amnesty International works with him to eliminate the death penalty in Zimbabwe. You can almost always find a common element with which to work people and try to move forward to advance human rights. John, I know you are eternally optimistic, so let us know where you see the hope and how you see what has to happen for it to prevail. I can't answer the bigger question, Charlene, but the hope is rooted in this room. I mean, we've spent two hours, two and a half hours, talking about the internal affairs of a small state in Southern Africa because it matters. Because it matters because we are organizing ourselves as a planet around sovereign states where what goes on with inside people's other sovereign states doesn't matter. Human rights are becoming more important than sovereign rights. And for Georgia Tech to acknowledge this by bringing Beatrice and Tetua from Zimbabwe here, and for us to spend time talking about this generic problem of rebalancing our planet around human rights from sovereign rights, gives me hope. Thank you, John. I just want to add my little two cents at the end. I think that given what I said at the very beginning about our information about small countries like Zimbabwe, uh, we need to demand of myself and other media practitioners 
that we provide you uh, with the information that you need to make good judgments about the rest of the world. Because as I said at the beginning, and as Martin Luther King often said, we are wrapped in a single garment of destiny. And what happens to Beatrice or any of the other activists in these countries working for human rights affects each and every one of us. And you look at the Ebola crisis and you know immediately or should know how anything that happens now in any part of Africa is a part of us too in some way or another. Thank goodness for Emory University and the work that it did on Ebola. Uh, thank goodness for the Carter Center and the work that it does and the work that all of you do. We are all wrapped in this single garment of destiny and I wanna thank Georgia Tech for being aware of that and honoring a woman who is one of the leaders uh, in the struggle for human rights uh, in the world because if it doesn't happen in Zimbabwe, it's not gonna happen anywhere else. Thank you. I feel obligated to say that one of the missions of the Ivan Allen College is to connect the global to the local. And I feel compelled to say that in 2014, at the sesquicentennial of the Civil War in the United States of America, my personal hope comes from the fact that 150 years ago today, I would have been considered not human. And today, I am the dean of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts at Georgia Tech. I think that there is hope in that. And what I want to do is a series of thank yous. One, to Charlene hunter Galt for being a wonderful moderator. <laughs> to our panelists for carrying on such a wonderful discussion of such important and critical issues. and to Beatrice Mtetwa for being the courageous woman that she is, for holding up the banner of human rights under the conditions that she does so.